Welcome to another episode of Ask a Pianist. My name is Andrew Ahrens, and today we'll be looking at some of the more complex and confusing openings by Beethoven in his piano sonatas. In previous episodes, I discussed fundamental concepts that give the listener concrete bearings. In simple openings, Beethoven establishes without a doubt the key and the characters involved. In more complex openings, he begins to create uncertainty with regard to the key or the characters or both, even going so far as to play occasional jokes by circumventing the audience's expectations. In today's episode, we'll have a look at a few of the truly mind-bending openings, ones which require quite a lot of thought in order to interpret in an effective way. So, without further ado, let us begin with perhaps the most famous deceptive opening in his Sonata Collection. to the Les Adieux Sonata causes quite a lot of consternation to musicians approaching it for the first time. In the slow introduction, we have no stable key centers at all, and the character of the piece appears to move back and forth between sorrow and consolation, only to be interrupted by a rather heroic set of gestures. In effect, the listener can't pin down what Beethoven means at all, because every expectation is left either unfulfilled or consciously sabotaged. So, let's break it down and see what is happening. First, let's consider the harmonic problem. In the first three chords, Beethoven sets up a deceptive cadence. The reason it sounds deceptive to our ears is that the first two chords follow the traditional line of 1-5-1, one, one, or tonic to dominant to tonic again. When we hear the first two chords, Then, we assume that the next chord will be an E-flat major chord. This is a very common chord progression used in pieces in order to establish or reinforce a key for the audience to hold on to. Beethoven has used this many times before, and his audiences expect this to happen, especially because this is the beginning of the piece. By going to the C minor chord instead, Beethoven breaks the expectation in perhaps the most effective and devastating way. We expect calm contentedness, and instead we get tragedy. Thank you. 
with three chords, Beethoven has effectively told his audience, don't get comfortable. This mantra extends to the material that follows this deceptive cadence. For a brief moment, the music suggests that we are indeed going to stay in C minor. But when he repeats the end cadence an octave above, he doesn't allow the music to rest, but instead pushes the harmony back to E flat major. It gets even more problematic from this point on for the casual observer. After pushing the harmony to E flat major again, he pulls out yet another deceptive cadence, this time to a completely foreign key. Granted, the audience has already been fooled once, and this is where Beethoven's awareness of human cognitive patterns really shows its strength. Think about this for a moment, and put yourself in the shoes of a composer. You've fooled the audience once by giving them a deceptive cadence at the beginning. Instead of this, you get this. The second time around, what should you do? Do you give the audience an actual proper cadence? Do you give them the same thing as the opening, almost reinforcing it or exaggerating it? Either way, these two options sit in the minds of the audience, and no matter what, they will be, to a small percentage, predictable. Beethoven therefore does the only thing he can do to avoid this, the only progression which is entirely unpredictable and yet still musically viable in this harmonic language. This really comes out of left field, because at least for a while, Beethoven was using similar keys. Both E flat major and C minor share the same key signature. But this shift to C flat major is quite far away from the other two. At this stage, Beethoven signals to the audience that there is nowhere he won't go, and therefore, all expectations must be thrown out the window. From the harmonic standpoint, Beethoven has effectively removed anything that is stable in the opening, but the effect is not only observed on the theoretical level. In tonal music of this time period, establishing a key is, in a sense, establishing a home base from which one can journey outwards from. When we think of the great myths and legends, the tradition of a hero going away from home in order to grow as a person and return to enrich their community is one that permeates through many pieces of music, but not necessarily on the literal term. Having a key that is stable at the beginning allows the audience to hear the contrasts that the composer creates against this home key. Without this frame of reference, without all subsequent keys being compared to the home key, we as an audience are unable to observe a hierarchy. In other words, without the hero having a home, we won't notice if he's close to home or far away from it. The danger is equal from all sides, and therefore renders the concept of distance empty and moot. This is why this opening can be difficult to digest on a first listen, because as written, there's no indication of a home. 
we're swimming in uncharted waters with no land in sight. This issue is further compounded by the extreme ambiguity present in the character of the piece. The first two chords sound optimistic, only to be contradicted immediately by the third. The first melodic phrase sounds rather dour or resigned. But then it's immediately contradicted by the second melodic phrase, which starts the same way, but takes a turn, almost towards a flighty or humorous vein. Once again, we have a character being directly contradicted, but what is most important to observe is that the contradiction occurs both times from within the musical material. Beethoven isn't writing completely different music to represent completely different characters. He's keeping everything roughly the same in terms of how the character begins to tell their story, but is changing the musical development of that character halfway through. Both of these chord sections can end the same way. Alternatively, they could both end like this. Both of these somber melodic sections can also end the same. is that Beethoven is showing his virtuosity in composition style by saying to us, all I have to do is change one thing, and the meaning of the phrase completely changes as well. To finish this opening section, Beethoven continues the idea of leaving a question for the audience instead of declaring a satisfying answer. These sets of chords ask a question both harmonically and gesturally. Instead of landing on the tonic, like this, it lands on the dominant, like this. This is a musical question, which has many answers. Does it resolve to the tonic again? Does it resolve to another chord, like the deceptive cadences at the beginning? The point is, we don't know. Similarly, the gesture the chords suggest is one of uncertainty due to the repetition of the musical situation. When we decide on something, it's done and we move on. But here, even in the later stages, when it can be interpreted as a resting point of sorts, Beethoven still readdresses it and changes the ending. Questions, questions, questions. He finally answers it all 
with a complete change in character, and something that resembles the establishment of a key. When we break down openings like this to understand what Beethoven is representing, it encourages us to get certain elements of the piece, which we simply would not on a first listen. I think it's appropriate at this stage to mention one facet that differentiates experienced listeners from novices. One of the most fundamental skills which is entirely overlooked in instrumental training is the combined abilities of recognizing patterns and judging the values of these patterns within an artistic or an historical context. As an example, when we listen to Beethoven, we know a few things for sure. He uses classical tonality, but expands the limits of it. He is surprisingly conservative rhythmically, and in his later periods of writing, he tends to incorporate gestures which are more commonly found in Baroque composition. This knowledge as a whole can only be gained by listening carefully to a lot of his music, as well as music that surrounds him historically. But we cannot have any idea of what he's trying to communicate in an opening like this unless we observe the lack of a key center and why this lack is a problem in his musical aesthetic. We wouldn't be troubled by this openness if we were listening to Liszt or Scriabin, for example. We might simply assume they're writing another piece that searches for a while. Consider for a moment the opening to the Tempest Sonata. Try to observe what we just talked about in the Les Adieux Sonata. Is there an established key? What is the character? Does he ask a question without answering it? is obviously less complex than the Les Adieux in terms of uncertainty, but it still provides shocking moments within the aesthetic. Harmonically, the greatest joke is played on us at the very beginning, with an A major chord. Why wouldn't we assume that he's starting the sonata in A major. It's no different than the opening of the fourth piano concerto. Or the pathetic sonata. To start a sonata with a slow chord sets up the expectation of a key center, and Beethoven destroys this quickly by showing us that the A major is actually the dominant of D minor, which is the real key. He further unsettles his audience 
by letting the line stop on one of the most jarring harmonies that he can find. Under normal circumstances in this time period, one would never land on this kind of harmony and hold it. The G-sharp, according to the rules of good behavior, should be a quick appoggiatura, perhaps like this. To do what Beethoven does is like a musical knife to the chest, and it sets up the torturous feeling that really grounds the whole movement. Beethoven plays the joke again, this time with a C major chord, which is not only foreign to A major, but also to D minor. But now that we're more familiar with Beethoven's tricks after looking at the Les Idea Sonata earlier, we can see that he's setting up a pattern of expectation and then sabotaging that expectation. This new familiarity that we have explains as well the conflicting musical gestures he presents. These two disparate elements of the slow chord and the two note slurred melody are no longer mysteries or confusing elements to be solved and reconciled. We now see them as Beethoven offering us two different characters that do not need to be related to each other. They're simply different characters, and they manifest themselves later on in the piece. For most people, the more we listen to something, the easier it is to understand. We can let the predictable elements fade into the background and focus on the unusual or interesting situations. With these complex openings, it is really no different. The threshold, however, is very different. The assumption that key relations will not be obvious or clear, or that gestures will not be unified, is an assumption that can only be comfortable and predictable to us if we've had a lot of experience listening to situations like this. I'm not saying that we have to assume that Beethoven will always present an unpredictable situation to us in an opening. What I'm saying is that establishing a firm key and character in the opening of a piano sonata is the norm, and when this norm is not fulfilled, then we have to accept that Beethoven is trying to make a statement about this norm and about what we as listeners expect. The only way to get an unpredictable opening like this on a first listen is to know what the conventions are, know what we should be expecting out of certain harmonies or gestures, and let our minds follow the joke if Beethoven leads us astray. Let's do one more opening, this time without explanation. Once again, listen for a key center, listen for gestures that are either similar or completely different, and let Beethoven take you for a bit of a ride.
Beethoven gives us all the familiar, unfamiliar things. Lack of a key center, melodies that do not resolve, and overall a sense of searching. It is no longer an opening that sounds strange or absurd to us if we apply what we know. Ultimately, unraveling this kind of unpredictability from any composer relies upon understanding what would be predictable. The expectation, and breaking the expectation, is what is most important. And if we do not understand this as a performer, our audience will never understand it as listeners. This extends to contemporary music as well, and I will tackle this subject in another episode of Ask a Pianist. So, until next time, keep practicing, and try to remember that if you hear something that sounds strange or unexpected, it usually means that you have an opportunity to reassess your own expectations, and in the process, learn something about yourself and the composer you are listening to. Bye for now.